then they can do that. Um, so hello, welcome to everybody. Um, my name is Helen Mason. I am the I4S Vice President. And before I hand over to our plenary speakers, just wanted to welcome everybody to our 36th annual Q methodology conference and also our first virtual Q conference. So this is not necessarily the type of conference that I was expecting when I put the first call for abstracts out back in the springtime. You know, we were all hoping to be in Orlando and that will happen in 2022, fingers crossed. Um, but one great thing about having a virtual conference is that we can open up to a much wider audience. So people here may have attended lots of Q conferences, but for many people, this will probably be their first Q conference. And in the short program that we've been able to put together this week, I'm hoping that it gives you a flavor of the type of things that we would normally be covering in our kind of person in person face to face conferences, and that hopefully more people will be able to take part in the Q conference in the future. The Q conference is organized and hosted by the International Society for the Scientific Study for Subjectivity, I for S for short, because that's really hard to say in my accent. And I would encourage people to check out our website, which is qmethod.org and learn more about what we do to support and promote the use of Q methodology. On Thursday, we have the I4S business meeting. And I would say to people, if you're unfamiliar with the society, then please come along, find out a bit more about what we do. We have the election of the new officers um, that people have been voting for online. And we definitely counted a lot quicker than the other election. And um, we will also have updates on our journal, Opera and Subjectivity. And also I will be telling you more about the location for our 2021 conference. So um, before I kind of finally hand over, I just wanted to say thank you to everybody who's helped uh, get this conference online. It's been a bit of a steep learning curve about what you can do online and what you can't. Um, but I hope that everybody enjoys the session today and also the other sessions that we have available to you this week. Um, remember that if you have any questions for the panel, then please put them in the Q&A section. And um, once the panel have um, had their initial discussion, then I'll be kind of fielding questions um, that, that are in the Q&A uh, to the rest of the panel. But now I'm going to hand over to uh, Dr. Jim Rhodes to introduce the plenary session. Thank you, Helen, and thank you for all your work on behalf of the society, in particular, putting this virtual conference together. Um, as Helen says, my name is Jim Rhodes. I'm the outgoing president of I4S. Uh, we'll be welcoming a new president at the business meeting. Um, and um, I welcome you all to uh, this virtual conference. My fellow panelists don't really need uh, much formal introduction. You all know who they are. Um, Dr. Stephen Brown, of course, is uh, probably, no doubt, the preeminent uh, Q methodological scholar of, of our time. Um, and uh, Dr. Dan Thomas is the co-author with his uh, friend Bruce McEwen of the uh, Q methodology uh, sage monographs that uh, every Q methodologist carries in his or her bag. Uh, to uh, refresh themselves and learn more about the, uh, the methodology. Professor Brown's book, Political Subjectivity, is uh, another foundational text. <clears throat> and so what we intend on doing today <clears throat> is uh, having a conversation with Professor Brown. Uh, Dr. Thomas and I were former students of Professor Brown's and uh, came to Q Methodology through, through him. And so we're going to have a conversation, and this conversation is going to run the gamut of uh, some introductory, foundational uh, issues with Q methodology, some intermediate um, concerns, some intermediate topics, and also some advanced and sophisticated. So we hope that we're going to be touching on things that uh, most of the audience wants to hear about. And if not, of course, there'll be opportunity at the end for Q&A. So um, I'm excited to get this going. And uh, I want to welcome and thank Dr. Brown and Dr. Thomas for joining in on this. And Dr. Brown, I guess what I would like to begin with is um, <clears throat> if you could talk a little bit about 
the differences between our methodology and Q methodology. Let's start at the very foundation here. Well, that is foundational. Um, although it's not uh, a finished argument, I think you would probably still find uh, people outside the Q community in particular, but perhaps even some within the Q community who still think of Q as starting off with a matrix of data that have been gotten from a number of respondents. And when you look at the relationship among the variables, that's our methodology. And if you take that same matrix and turn it on its side, transpose it in technical statistical terms uh, and uh, analyze the relationship among individuals, that, that's what Q methodology is. Uh, that was certainly the understanding back in the 1930s with uh, Sir Cyril Burt, who was the successor to Charles Spearman at the University of London, um, and to a number of others, Godfrey Thompson, uh, who was also a Sir, like Sir Cyril Burt, Sir Charles Spearman, Sir Godfrey Thompson, um, uh, and all major factor analysts. I, Hans Isaac, these would be names that, that new members of the community in particular, but perhaps even some older ones uh, had not heard of or maybe vaguely heard of. But these were very prominent factor analysts uh, back in the day. Um, you even found this as early as the early uh, 2000s. Uh, it was a Paul Meal, I think, um, who was the co-author of a, of a book, Advanced uh, Sage book on uh, psychometrics, whose view of um, of uh, Q methodology was that you just took the standard R matrix, turned it on its side and, and reanalyzed uh, the scores. Stevenson was very emphatic about this from the very outset that there never was a single matrix of data to which both R and Q apply. For him, it was a matter of definition. It was a definition that either Cyril Burt and Hans Isaac and, and others, R.B. Cattell, either did not understand or just frankly didn't accept. But for Stevenson, it was just a matter of definition that when you're dealing with the area, uh, with things that are objective about people, my height is something objective about me, my, my weight, uh, my, uh, which is going up during the pandemic, uh, <laughs> all this casual eating, not being able to go out, get exercise. Um, uh, but even things like your IQ test and all of those kinds of things are things that are objective about you. And in that domain, that is what he meant by R methodology and why he gave it a capital R, which was just simply the, the uh, Pearson correlation R, lowercase r, generalized to all things that are objective. But then you have the world of subjectivity. It's one thing to take uh, a bunch of tests, like an IQ test and a reading test and a math test and so on and so forth. It's another thing to ask people, well, did you enjoy that test? Oh, that was fun. You know, I kind of like putting puzzles together. Now you're in the field of subjectivity, of people's likes and dislikes, the things that they enjoy, the things that they dislike. Um, and that is a different domain. There's no right or wrong. It, it, it's not right or wrong that you enjoyed taking a an IQ test. You just either enjoyed it or you didn't. Same way with ice cream. Some people like pistachio, some people don't. They like chocolate or, or chocolate peanut, or pe uh, peanut butter ripple, one of my favorites. Um, or, or, or tobacco blends back in the day when people would smoke pipes and things like that. Uh, these, are, these are things that people enjoy or have some feelings about. And that was the domain of Q methodology and with a capital Q to to represent the generalization of all things that are subjective. Um, so that is it in a nutshell. Those are two different domains. You have one set of data that, are, that represent uh, scores that are things that are objective about people. But then you can also get uh, a matrix of data, for example, from Q sorts, that gives you plus fives and plus fours and minus twos and so forth that represent things that people like um, or dislike, um, things that they feel happy or sad about, uh, uh, things that they feel uh, angry 
or pleased about. Um, and all of that is the domain of the Q methodology. That does not come as news for most people in the Q community, but um, it, it was not common knowledge because as I say, Cyril Burt went to his grave thinking that R and Q were just, for him, he had the rest, uh, reciprocity principle that on the basis of the factor loadings and the scores on the individual tests, on the basis of that, you could then derive what the Q factor loadings would be from R. But that assumed that you were dealing with one common set of data. The fact that you had another set of data that had to do with subjectivity, and those were two different domains, and that R methodology referred to one of them and Q methodology to the other, by definition, um, was something that he never really grasped. I don't know if that's enough, but. Well, I think that, uh, yeah, that's that's good. And, and I should again, remind the audience that because this is uh, going to be recorded as Dr. Mason said, we're, we're trying to cover a wide range of topics. Uh, my suspicion is that most people in this audience here are familiar with the concepts that Dr. Brown just elucidated, but there may be people in the future who are looking at the video and, and want to get some uh, additional information about that topic. Uh, keeping with that, um, and this idea of the differences between R and Q, uh, you've, we, you've encountered this over your time in writing about it from editors and, and reviewers and others who aren't familiar with Q. The question of the justification for small numbers in, in our research, the idea that uh, we can make any kind of conclusion, draw any kind of conclusion or make any kind of claim on the basis of maybe 30 people who did a Q-sort. Uh, would you talk a little bit about that? And then I'd also encourage Dr. Thomas to follow up on that, and maybe uh, talk about that from his own experiences. Um, yes, that is uh, a battle that still has to be refought uh, in these days. In fact, I think I I was talking to someone, it may have just been a, a personal conversation with someone uh, uh, over email uh, who had encountered that from some editors and reviewers. Um, in, uh, now, they never will question that if you're doing a multiple regression analysis, that you're only using six variables or eight variables or something like that. Uh, they'll never question that. Whereas in Q, <laughs> even if we have a Q sample, as of 30 people, oftentimes it's considered just too small. You should have, you know, 40, 50 uh, statements. And back in Stevenson's day, they would have over a hundred uh, statements, uh, but that's gradually been uh, lessened. Um, but uh, so that won't be questioned in, in our methodology, uh, but they will question the number of people not realizing that in a way, and this is just metaphorical, in a way, the people are equivalent to variables in uh, an R study. Uh, and so you don't need as many people because you're just wanting to see how is the audience, whether it's the audience of people talking about Donald Trump or they're talking about some issue in forestry or environmental studies or something in the area of health sciences. If you're wanting to know how is the audience about this segmented, what, how many basically different points of view are there that exist? Um, then you don't need a lot of people. You just need some people who think this way, and we'll call that factor A, and some people who think this way, we'll call that factor B, and people who feel this way, we'll call that factor C. Uh, and once you get five or six people of each type, uh, and you uh, enable them to represent their point of view, and they're doing it essentially the same way, each one of them within a particular factor, that gives you a pretty clear understanding of how that way of thinking works. How is it that those people think about it? And then here's another group of people and how do they think about it? And it doesn't take a lot of people to see that, you know, what's the difference between this way of thinking and some other kind of way of thinking. Um, and statistically, it's the same thing. That is when you're calculating the reliability. How, how reliable is this factor? Uh, if we go out and give these people the Q sort again, how 
likely is it that you'll end up with the set of statement scores for that factor, essentially the, the way you got it the first time? Uh, how stable is this point of view? And we find that, again, if you get four, five, six people with reasonably high and pure loadings on a factor, that the factor that you get out is going to look pretty much the way at time two, the way it did at time one, in the same way with factor B and the factor C. Uh, and when you actually calculate the correlates, which is done automatically in, in the Q programs like PCQ, uh, microcurrent PCQ, and like uh, the, the PQ method program of Peter Schmoltz um, and of uh, Sean Banasek's Cade program, uh, they all have this kind of, um, of logic built into them, the statistical logic. And so when you get the uh, reliability, if, if we assume that each person has a personal reliability of about 0.8, that is you give them a two sort again, the correlate the way they, you know, with the way they did it the first time to the extent of 0 0.8, 0 0.75, 0 0.85 in that range usually, although that can vary, um, that the factor that you get will have a will have a stability of reliability of, of a point, uh, uh, 0.95 uh, with five people who are defining the factor. If you boost it up to 10 people, get more people, the reliability may be 0 0.96, 0 0.97. You, you don't gain any more reliability with more people because you're really trying to see qualitatively how do these people think and how is that different from the way this other group of people think. And for that, you don't need large numbers of cases. Uh, that also implicates things like single case studies, which is a, something different, but I presume that will come up at, uh, at some point. Yeah, we'll, we are go definitely going to get to that. Uh, Dr. Thomas, in your experience with uh, editors, uh, has this been a big stumbling block in some cases for you? Sure. Uh, I think anybody that's uh, dealt with uh, uh, journals in the, in the, at the heart of whatever their discipline is, has run into this. Um, I, I would say a couple things. First, uh, I think it's in political subjectivity, but um, I know somewhere uh, Steve has talked about uh, the use of grand numbers in Q in the actual uh, sorting of statements. Uh, if you have a Q sample size N equals 40, uh, each one of the 40 items is being compared with the other 39 implicitly. And so when you, when you uh, think of it in those terms, uh, one of the reasons that we find uh, my second point, which is reliable schematics uh, or reliability ac across time and uh, P sets is uh, because you're really doing something that's quite complicated implicitly. Uh, can't imagine what it would be like to do a hundred uh, statement Q sort, but um, even more so in that case, you would have uh, implicitly thousands of independent par paired comparisons. Uh, and then the second point I would make from my personal experience is that um, the idea of reliable schematics. I, I think it was uh, a piece that Steve wrote in uh, the first years of operant subjectivity talking about reliable schematics, which is the, the data showing um, that uh, the Q methodology's approach to reliability is quite different than uh, our methodology's approach to reliability. Now, uh, if editors of journals uh, view things differently, uh, some are uh, open to that level of conversation, others aren't. Uh, that's, uh, that's about it uh, at this point. Later, when we get into the question of single case studies, uh, We'll have uh, more to say about the, the nature of generalization across uh, study. Okay, yeah, we will come back to that, and uh, and the, and more broadly too, the idea of generalization of factors. But um, this is really the last uh, question I have that's sort of foundational, 
The rest of them are, I think, a bit more sophisticated. The forced free argument that has gone on for some time that uh, when you force someone to follow a distribution, you are imposing, according to the critics, some level of artificiality that uh, it makes your data uh, suspect. Uh, would you respond to that? Yeah, that, that used to come up uh, quite regularly uh, years ago. The last published article having to do with uh, the, forced, the so-called forced distribution as opposed to a free distribution. The forced distribution being as shown in the background behind your head there. Mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, you know, there's two items that go under plus four and three items that go under plus three and, and so on and so forth. And everybody has to follow that distribution. Now, that was... Uh, questioned back in the, uh, I don't remember anything from the 40s, but certainly in the 50s, starting in the 50s, there were a number of articles. Then in the, in the 60s, that continued. Uh, the last one that dealt with that issue in published form was uh, an article by John Boland, which appeared in the, in the journal uh, Political Methodology back in, I think, 1985. Uh, and I think uh, and here hats are off to uh, the, the Q method discussion list. That was the last time it appeared in print so far as I'm aware, uh, because I think it gets worked out on the Q method discussion list. Uh, somebody who's coming along with a PhD and saying, well, my advisor uh, questioned my use of a force distribution. Uh, what's a good argument, but, uh, you know, to uh, defend myself against my advisor or, or maybe some, somebody has encountered that question from a reviewer of a journal article. Uh, and so it will be discussed on the Q method discussion list and it'll get worked out at that level uh, so that there's been less of a need apparently for anything in published form. Um, now, when, when Stevenson suggested the force distribution, um, he, he thought of it as a model. And he used to mention that in class that, and he meant a model in a scientific sense. And he would refer us to a paper by uh, um, Rosenbluth and Wiener in the journal uh, Philosophy of Science that was back in 1945 uh, that talked about the role of models in science. Wiener incidentally was a Nobel laureate, later on was an MIT a substantial person um, and talking about the nature of models in science and the, and the best model for a cat, for example, is another cat. Uh, and in fact, the best model for this cat is this cat. Uh, uh, and so you have material models and then you have formal models and Q methodology is just a sort of a formal model of the way people think about anything, whether it's about the US elections or about food preferences or preferences for ice cream or pipe tobacco or whatever it might be that there's very few uh, flavors of ice cream, let's say, that are really important that I really like. And every time I go to the ice cream stand, I'll order one of those two or three that are my favorites. There's some I wouldn't touch with a 10-foot pole. I just don't like the taste of them. Uh, most of them are come see, come saw. They don't matter that much. And it looks something like a normal distribution. Um, and so it, the idea was that the normal, the, 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 uh, the fixed force distribution isn't that far off from the way people think. But what Stevenson didn't want to say was that this is the way people think and everybody must use that. And it was that that stimulated opposition. Why we shouldn't impose that on people. We should allow people to do it their own way as if their way of doing it was the right way, even for just that one person. There is no right way. It wasn't proposed to start off with as the right way. It was proposed as a model. Look, I'm gonna give you a bunch of statements. This is what I'd like for you to do with them. I would like for you to make a decision as to which two you most like. And so I sometimes phrase this in, in terms of the difference between likes on the one hand versus preferences. I may very well like these 10 statements and if I'm not constrained by a force distribution, I may give all of those 10 statements a plus five and all of these 20 statements a minus five because I don't like them. If we're just talking about likes, but I say, well, okay, uh, given that you like all of these 10 statements, what two of them do you prefer over the other uh, that are in that group? 
uh, that is, uh, reveal for me your preferences if you have to choose. Because in those cases, you may like statements one through 10, but I might, li might, might prefer one and two more than three or four. Uh, and therefore, uh, when I am shown, when I show my preferences, I start making distinctions that I would not make were it not for the force distribution. Um, Stevenson talked about uh, revealing an operant response. Uh, there are preferences that are hidden amongst your likes. Um, uh, and, and, and Thaler, who won the Nobel for economics you know, five or eight years ago, uh, talked about nudges uh, in, in, in economics. Sometimes you just need to nudge people a particular way and that, that, that affects sales, for instance. Um, the, the Q sword is sort of a soft prompt. It's sort of a nudge, encouraging people to make distinctions that without the, the nudge, they wouldn't make. And therefore, they, they reveal preferences that are there. And they, then the question becomes, well, are they reliable? Well, if we give them the Q sword again, because some people will say, um, look, you're forcing me to make a distinction that I don't really make. Well, if you, just for my sake, if you would do it anyway, follow the force distribution. And so they select statement one and two to be their most like, and then three, four, and five are their next most like. And then you ask them again a month later. Now, if they were making just uh, random decisions, next time they may put statements three and four at the top and one and two down lower, if they were just random decisions, but usually they're not random decisions. That is at time two, they do the same thing. They select statement one and statement two for their higher ones and statement three, four, and five for the less high. So there's some, there's some reliability to what they feel like is an arbitrary choice on their point. It's not really arbitrary. Um, and there, there were yeah. some psychometric studies of that uh, done back before the turn of the century, from the 19th to the 20th century. And for the R methodologists who uh, tend to critique this, uh, you know, this you've demonstrated and others have demonstrated that there isn't a whole lot of statistical difference between the forced and the free distribution. No. So from even a, you know, we ask people to do that for theoretical reasons, not for statistical reasons. Okay. Yeah. And the statistical reason, uh, statistics don't really matter here. Yeah. Um, that's right. Uh, it seems to noted, you know, we, we could ask people if we have a Q sort of, of 40 statements to do just a rank ordering from one to 40, but that would put too much of a burden. So the force distribution was sort of a compromise between uh, asking people to rank order the statements uh, on one end and then letting them just put however many they want, you know, the so-called free distribution, unforced distribution on the other hand. Uh, plus, uh, Stevenson also pointed out that, that this uh, distribution followed the law of error. That is when you're flipping coins, you know, and counting the number of heads out of 10 tosses of the coin, sometimes you get five heads and five tails on 10 tosses, but sometimes you get seven heads and three tails, and you do that a number of times, it will tend to, to fall into something approximating a normal curve. Uh, and there's all kinds of things that follow uh, a normal curve. If you, you know, take the, the height of the trees outside my window, most of them are average height. Very few, relatively fewer of them are very short, and relatively fewer of them are very tall. Um, if you take the speed of the automobiles that are, you know, go past in front of my house, most of them are going an average amount of speed. Some of them are a little faster than that. Some of them are a little bit slower than that. Uh, and he said, if the, if the Greeks had known about the normal curve, they would have built a statue to it. Uh, because, uh, uh, you know, there are just so many things in the world. And therefore, uh, uh, adopting the, <clears throat> the law of error and the, the normal distribution, the Gaussian uh, distribution, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, was to adopt something that it appeared quite frequently in the natural world. Um, there's a very good article about this in uh, uh, Louis Manan's book, The Metaphysical uh, Society, which is about uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes and William James and 
and Charles Sanders Peirce and a number of, of Harvard philosophers who got together uh, back in the latter part of the, of the 19th century to work out what became American pragmatism, didn't have a name at the time. And uh, one of the contributions that Peirce made was uh, the law of error. He and his father, who was a statistician, oftentimes used that in arguments in court to, uh, to show you know, the, the likelihood that some piece of evidence could have occurred due to chance. Um, and uh, so the, adopting this as a model, and again, it was a scientific model. It was not a conclusion that this is the way people think. Actually, people don't think that differently from the model, but it is a model, a, science, a scientific model. Well, uh, in the interest of time, we're going to move to some more uh, advanced concepts. And I'd like to hear from both of you on this. The idea or the principles, I guess, of lawfulness, as Stevenson talked about it with regard to uh, Q methodology. And, um, and if you would, if you could segue from that to uh, Newton's fifth rule and talk a little bit about what Stevenson had in mind there, what Newton's fifth rule is or was, and how uh, Stevenson applied that to Q methodology. Mm -hmm. So uh, why don't you start, uh, Professor Brown, and then I'd like to hear from Professor Thomas. Um, yeah, Stevenson, even as far back as the study of behavior, his book, uh, referred to lawfulness. He didn't place a lot of emphasis on it, but he did mention it in that book. In fact, I. I think there may be even a line item in the index about uh, lawfulness. Um, but certainly in his 1974 paper on um, um, single case studies, um, he talked a good bit about lawfulness. And then also in his 1980 chapter on uh, consiring, he spoke a lot about lawfulness. And then throughout the 1980s until his death in 1989, he talked quite a bit about, about lawfulness. Uh, and he referred in this regard to uh, a paper by Moritz Schlick, um, who was writing back in, I don't know, the 19 teens or the 20s or something. Schlick was the um, founding president of the Vienna circle of logical positivists. Uh, and Schlick had a very pragmatic view about laws. They weren't sort of uh, eternal truths uh, but they were just um, regularities that had been it, it, events that had occurred with enough regularity as to create a lively expectation uh, that they will occur again. Uh, and that, uh, that this enabled the scientists then to expect certain things to occur. Like we expect that somebody who is an adjusted person uh, when doing a Q-sort and then when you ask them to, to give an ideal Q sort, that there'll be a correlation, a significant positive correlation between the two, because adjusted people are well adjusted. They are to some extent uh, like their ideal because they, they have become adjusted to the world. Uh, this was something that Carl Rogers in counseling uh, psychology discovered over and over again, that people who were are, who are non-neurotic, who were relatively pleased with themselves, <clears throat> when you give them the cue sort of time one, describe yourself and then describe your ideal self, it would be correlated. And the people who were depressed, uh, neurotic, unhappy, they would describe themselves one way. They would describe the, the, an ideal person a different way because that was part of their problem. They didn't like the way they were. The, I would prefer to be something other than I am. Uh, and therefore, that had led to a, a good bit of unhappiness in their lives. So they were not adjusted to the situation. They would want change, and that's what drove them in to the counseling center to seek help. Um, but this applies to all kinds of things. If you ask people during the Trump period, for instance, who were progressive liberals, what you, what's your ideal for America, and what do you think Trump's America is, they would be uncorrelated with one another, if not negatively correlated. And that was a sort of a measure of the extent to which they were not adapted. They had not adjusted to that model of America. Um, so this can apply. You can ask people, you know, in the health sciences field, but 
how would you describe your own health and what would be, you know, an ideal healthy person, but the person who's fit and who exercises and so forth, it's going to be highly correlated because the way they are and the way they like to be are very close. But somebody who is not fit, who's been driven into, uh, is it, uh, you know, you know, health anonymous or some group like that, uh, uh, because they are not the way they would like to be, uh, they would be their, their self and their ideal would be uh, would be uncorrelated. Uh, so, but there are many other kinds of laws that, that people, people's self-concept is going to be similar over time. For example, that is your description of your point of view about anything is probably going to persist. So if I ask you again five years from now, you're probably going to be correlated with the way it was before, unless there has been some dramatic change in the interim, uh, some change in the society or some change in your life uh, that has interrupted your way of thinking. Uh, but in general, we, we tend to maintain our points of view about things on a fairly regular basis. And that was, uh, I forget the name of the psychologist who, who talked about the similarity over time, but that was somebody's law. William James's law was that when you have one person who does a number of Q sorts, uh, describe yourself, what, what do you think, your, your, your wife thinks your point of view is, or your spouse thinks your point of view is, or what do you think your mother thinks your point, what do you think your best friend thinks your point of view is, that they will all tend to be very similar to one another. But how about your boss who doesn't like you, takes it into you, what do you think his point of view is about? It's going to be different. So some Q sorts are going to be, uh, are going to be me because they're going to be on the same factor with my own view of myself. And some Q sorts are not me. Uh, and that came from William James. Uh, and so James had, had developed this kind of concept that, that, uh, that, there, that throughout life, there are going to be things that are like you and things that are not like you. And so that was James's law. Uh, and there were a number of laws. Uh, uh, there was, oh, what was his name? Uh, the existential uh, psychoanalyst. Um, I'm, bl I'm blanking on his name right now, but uh, had the view that, that, that some lives have a certain uh, dynamic toward their own fulfillment. I, just this morning, uh, Garrison Keillor, his poem was, or he, ha he had a segment, he talked about the life of Anne Sexton, uh, who's a poet, and I think this was the, <clears throat> her birthday today. Uh, and there was somebody who, who, by today's terminology, would have been termed bipolar, and so she had this kind of destructiveness that was in her system, that was in her interpersonal relationships, and it was driven toward a particular end, uh, which was suicide at the end, she killed herself at the end. Uh, so that there was that existential law that some lives have a certain dynamic built into. Um, there were laws about change. People when asked to change are gonna change in directions that that they've already conceived of. They're not gonna change in some direction that hasn't even crossed their mind yet. And that was, I think, Perlin's law. Perlin was a psychologist at uh, the um, National Institute of Mental Health, I think when Stevenson was there briefly. So there were various of these kinds of laws. And that uh, one thing that I think was probably frustrating for him and has been for me too toward the end of my career is that uh, there's been very little work by people in the Q methodology community looking at, at the more concreteness of human life, uh, which is manifest primarily in single case studies. Uh, very few people have looked at single cases. There was a, a review of Q methodological work by uh, Gretchen Snegas, for instance, recently on sustainability. Uh, uh, we point to all kinds of things like how often do people use principal components as opposed to centroid, how often do they use Veramax, uh, and all of these are just sort of the external props of Q methodology. They're not at the heart of Q methodology at all. The heart of Q methodology has to do with subjectivity and, and, and how does subjectivity work, and that is gotten by looking at single cases where these laws manifest themselves. But very few people are doing that. She didn't mention anything about any of the Q sorts that she was uh, summarizing had done single case studies or not, because none of them had. 
<clears throat> there was a similar one by uh, Lundberg and uh, uh, Delu from um, Holland, uh, Lundberg from Sweden, uh, on uh, a use of Q in uh, educational psychology. It was an inventory of all the features of Q methodology, like whether you did principal components or centroid, whether you use large numbers of people or small numbers of people and all of that kind of thing, but nothing about single cases. And I think uh, that is one of the frustrations that, that uh, in the community of Q methodology, nobody's really gotten, has really addressed the heart of what Q methodology was and what Stevenson was interested in. He developed the Q sort, use the factor analysis and so forth to implement the study of single case to find out more about subjectivity. We tend to do studies in which we get factor A, factor B, factor C, uh, write up what's the distinguishing statements amongst them, what are the consensus statements, give an interpretation of each factor, write a conclusion and publish it. Uh, but what would happen if you would take all these factor A types and give them a single case study, you would find that underneath that commonality, that they're all factor A type, is a wild buzzing, uh, uh, chaotic kind of activity below the surface in the lives of those people who comprise factor A. They're all quite different in many ways. Just like, you know, uh, atoms may act some kind of way, but inside atoms, there's a buzz of, of all these subatomic particles. Uh, and that's what interesting uh, physicists, not that they're atoms, but that there are all these things going on, the life that's going on inside atoms and the life that's going on inside of of people inside these factors is uh, I, I think that's really an important point because as i read stevenson and as i've read your work uh amplifying and elucidating uh some of the uh, statements and ideas of stevenson single case to me seems to be really at the heart of what he was interested in yeah and, it, is. Uh, it is and i think that that's something that i agree with you has not been a big part of of the work that we've all done, uh, although many of us have done single case studies, um, it, it, the numbers of those studies pale in comparison to the number of extensive studies in q methods. And I think that's because he was a physicist. He had that knowledge of all of this activity that was going on at the subatomic level, which is why he was writing about, you know, uh, uh, Niels Bohr and, and William James at, at the end of his life and about the relationship between Q methodology and quantum theory. And um, I do want to get to that, but I, I want to hear from both of you on Newton's fifth rule, because I think that is something that is not well understood among any <laughs> in the Q community. And be mindful uh, that we're, we're past 45 minutes now. I so. know. Well, I, 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 we, we started late though, Steve, we started late. I, I, I want to go for about no more than five or 10 more minutes and then we'll open right. it up to questions. Good. And so if we talk about Newton's fifth rule, we'll come back to quantum and then we'll, we'll end for our session. Mm -hmm. So if you guys want to talk about Newton's fifth rule, I would appreciate that. I can. I'll, I'll defer to Steve on that one. Okay. Um, well, then we'll come me, to you on uh, the next one. All right. Uh, let yeah, me well, just well, uh, Newton's fifth rule doesn't really have that much to do with quantum theory. I mean, Newton didn't know no. anything about quantum theory. Um, and of single cases, uh, but it was also part of Stevenson's um, uh, interests and related to, to his others of his interests. Um, Newton was actually toying around at the end of his career with what is the nature of phenomenon. If, if, if science, you know, and his, and his four rules, and I, off the top of my head, I'm not going to be able to remember, but uh, uh, that uh, to similar effects where you assign the same cause uh, unless there's reason to believe otherwise. So that uh, the, the, uh, the explanation of, uh, of the, the fire that constitutes the sun and, the, and our culinary fireplace are the same, um, uh, and, and again, until we have evidence to the contrary. And he had some other uh, rules of reasoning. These are in his uh, book on uh, uh, reasoning in, in uh, natural philosophy by which he meant what today we would call physics. <clears throat> and, uh, and this was back in uh, 16, I think he died, I think in 1627. Uh, and in, he was getting ready to come out with the third edition of his book. Uh, and in the second edition, 
where he described these rules of reasoning in science, he had scribbled out in uh, Latin because his book was written in Latin. That was the language of science back in those days. Um, that, uh, uh, that phenomenon included not just these objective kinds of things like the explanation of fire and heat and velocity and, and his uh, you know, uh, laws of thermodynamics and, and all of that uh, kind of business, but also the fact that I, I feel hungry, I feel happy, I feel this, and he, he just listed off a number of things. And it was clear that he was thinking about expanding what constitutes a phenomena, a phenomena. If you're going to explain, if the role of science is to explain phenomena, what are we going to mean by phenomena? Uh, and he was toying around with that, but he had had a very difficult struggle with Descartes over the over the uh, pr priority priority over uh, uh, the calculus uh, uh, because Descartes had you know, advertised that he had invented uh, calculus, but but. Uh, 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 Newton had actually used it, but had not published anything about it, but had invented it 10 years before that. And he was able to show that he actually was 10 years ahead of, of Descartes. Uh, and, and he had gone through difficulties with religious people because his view about the, the universe was that the universe would gradually slow down because of entropy, you know, into nothingness. Uh, and, and the religious leaders were saying, well, you know, God would not create an imperfect universe. So Newton, you must be wrong. God wouldn't, wouldn't do it that way. And so that one of his rules of reasoning was the priority of, of, uh, of uh, experimental demonstration, experimentation over um, hypotheses. And so his famous line, hypotheses non fingo in, in uh, Latin, or I do not invent uh, hypotheses to invent, you know, explanations for things, but I depend on demonstration, experimental uh, demonstration. So he, uh, some theory, theorists have it that he just didn't want to fight another fight. He was old, he was in his 80s. Uh, let's not get in a fight over what constitutes phenomena. But he was, your Stevenson was very excited about this finding, which was by a French uh, historian of science and discovered this in Newton's uh, uh, effects that had, would, had been preserved by Cambridge University, uh, scribbled in his own personal copy of the Principia, the second edition, as if he was toying around with expanding his four rules to a fifth rule that covered what we would call subjectivity. Uh, and so uh, Stevenson was saying one of Newton's problems when he didn't have a methodology, he didn't have Q methodology around to be able to make an experimental demonstration along with his other rules of reasoning in science, that, that everything depends on experimental demonstration on running experiments and that kind of thing. <clears throat> and therefore, he didn't want to get into a, a battle with somebody over this. He was old, you know, let's, let's not have another fight. Um, so Stevenson's, uh, all of his writings about Newton's fifth rule, and there were many of them um, in uh, the American Psychologist. First, there was a comment and then a full length paper on Newton's fifth rule in, in educational psychology or something like that in 1981, I think, if memory serves. Uh, and then a number of others, many of which were in operant subjectivity. That, that little journal has got a lot of wisdom of Stevenson's papers that he didn't get published uh, during his lifetime that are, that are in the back issues of the journal that are very worthwhile reading. Uh, so you can, you can uh, sit down and represent an accuser. Well, what do you think uh, Newton's view was about the nature of the universe? He, Stevenson had, had got this cue sample full of all these ideas about the nature of the universe. Um, what, what was Newton's view? What was Descartes' view? What was uh, 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 Giordano Bruno's point of view? He had defended uh, Copernicus and was burned at the stake for it. Um, uh, and you could represent all of those, including your own, Stevenson's personal point of view, to see where your view fit in with all of these other schools of thought. Uh, so he was demonstrating how Q could be used to investigate things from the standpoint of this fifth rule that Newton was toying with, that he never 
really published and there's been, been controversy about why he didn't do that and different theories about it. And Stevenson did, he didn't have a methodology for reducing it to experiments. Thanks, uh, Dan, before we turn it over to questions from the audience, I, you had mentioned earlier uh, uh, talking about single case and you, you said, well, we can talk about that later when we talk about single case. So let's, I, I'd like to hear from you about what you might have to say about single case and then we'll open it up to the audience. And perhaps somebody in the audience will ask about quantum. But would you like well, to say something about single case? Um, sure. Uh, first, let me just say a word about lawfulness. Uh, I think uh, those of us that were reared uh, before uh, Q uh, on the nature of textbook science thought lawfulness was a conclusion. Uh, and I think Steve has put it just right in saying, uh, well, with human behavior, it's slightly, slightly different. You don't have a temperature at which water boils and um, that's invariable. Uh, but take Rogers law, for example, that under conditions of adjustment, uh, ideal self and self Q sorts would be on the same factor. Um, I think it was Steve that pointed out in graduate seminars that when you had people that were serving uh, uh, life sentences in prison, that if they had them do two Q sorts, one for their self and self ideal, they would be identical virtually. Mm -hmm. If you had Donald Trump uh, do two Q sorts, one for self and self ideal, they would be identical. So you're falling short of a, of, of a lawfulness in the sense of textbook science, the, the temperature at which water boils. Uh, and uh, it took me a while until I did um, actually a, a study of myself uh, mimicking uh, what Stevenson did when he turned 70 and retired from the University of Min uh, Missouri, uh, that I understood that his view was entirely pragmatic, uh, lawfulness, I mean, there were a dozen laws uh, as he understood them, not as conclusions, as final statements regarding the relationship between variables, but as places to look as um, sort of navigational aids as he's sorting through uh, subjective phenomena, um, which leads me to ask Steve and uh, as kind of a segue here, uh, what what uh, what does abduction have to do with Q sorting? And uh, and uh, another word that uh, has come up in the conversation thus far, operant. Uh, those two those two words. It seems to me, uh, even for folks that have been around Q for a long time, are crucial uh, in distinguishing. Well, first, the, let me say that that the. Uh... A psychopathic killer who's who's in prison and his self and ideal are congruent that's because he's adjusted to his situation if you're in prison and you myself i'm a big tough guy no you know i don't take anything off anybody and you say well what would be ideal well my ideal would be a tough guy who doesn't take anything you have to have that kind of <laughs> self-ideal congruence to be adjusted to that to that prison situation and Donald Trump may indeed have to say that the way I am and the way I would be the ideal is an adjustment to his situation. Uh, you know, we're, we shouldn't be putting ourselves vulnerable to trying to psychoanalyze Donald Trump. But the, but the idea of being that, uh, that there are many different kinds of situations to be adjusted to. Uh, and it's the ideal, it's the idea that the person is adjusted to that situation with the self and the ideal are congruent with one another. Uh, but that's a little bit to the, to the side of uh, the idea about uh, abduction. Abduction incidentally has to do with, with the so-called logic of, of discovery, of uh, the role of guessing, uh, speculation, and so forth in science and what role do they have. Uh, a lot of scientists would rule that out uh, as being part of science because most of science is hypothetical deductive that you have a theory and you deduce certain testable propositions from that, and then you run experiments on, you know, each one of those hypotheses. So most uh, PhD dissertations 
will start off with some kind of theory and I'm going to test this hypothesis and then they do F tests and T tests and so on and so forth to, to prove that and that shows that the theory you know, was true or that the theory needs to be modified or whatever. Uh, the, the idea of, of abduction comes from Charles Sanders Peirce, who was part of that metaphysical society at Harvard, uh, who, um, who started off regarding uh, abduction. Uh, induction goes from specifics to general, you know, getting a bunch of observation, then from that, getting it some a general rule from that. Uh, deduction starts with the general rule and then deduces certain consequences from that that can then be tested. Uh, inductively. Uh, abduction goes from effects back to potential causes. Um, and, and so, uh, and, and what are plausible uh, causes? That it, how would we explain this? Well, it could be such and such. That's, that's, a hypo that's a plausible hypothesis because if that was true, then these observed effects would, would follow from that. But there may be some other plausible uh, hypotheses as well. And so abduction was a matter of guessing your way to, to truth. Uh, now, uh, originally, uh, Peirce uh, regarded abduction as a form of inference, just like induction and deduction. Um, uh, but later on in his later uh, thinking, uh, he reduced it, well, didn't reduce it, really expanded it, that to the role of guessing. One of his major papers toward the end of his life was called guessing. Uh, and the role of guessing, that, that science is guessing or it's nothing else, uh, that that is really the essence of science. Uh, and guessing leads us to, to carry out certain kinds of, of uh, experiments because we, we guess, we abduce. So, so that uh, Sherlock Holmes with whom a purse has been compared, um, would do that. Why was it that the dog didn't bark? That, that stood out for Holmes, you know, that, that here was a, a theft that had occurred, but there was a dog there. Why didn't the dog bark? Well, that must be because the dog knew the thief. You know, that was a guess that he made and that narrowed down the search. Now we're looking for somebody who was known to the person who experienced the theft uh, because the dog didn't bark. Uh, so there were a number of those kinds of things. Holmes would always say it's Elementary, my dear Watson, just a matter of deduction, but, but the philosophers say, no, it wasn't deduction. What he was really describing was abduction, and that's what was in common with, uh, with uh, uh, Charles Sanders first. But there is an ex a sense also in which, particularly when you think of abduction as being guessing, and this is where Stevenson started really connected with, with Peirce, uh, and he plays this up from I think he may have mentioned abduction in uh, the study of behavior, but certainly in his paper in 1961, there's one abductory reasoning, reasoning or something like that. And then throughout the rest of his life that he uh, talked about abduction. And these, but for Stevenson, it was a much more, uh, like with Peirce, a much more active kind of thing. That is abductions would lead you to look in certain places for certain solutions, that it, was, it wasn't just a matter of getting uh, a particular event and then inventing a cause. That was kind of a passive kind of way of thinking at, because a lot of people will talk about abduction in Q, you know, that I get the Q sorts and now I'm forced to make an explanation of them and my explanation of them, my description of these factors uh, is the, the manifestation of abductory reasoning. Well, in part, but that's the kind of passive thing. That's sitting around and waiting until the factors get there and then inventing some sort of explanation for them. But what about thinking of abduction as something that leads you to seek out certain people to do the Q-sort, uh, leads you to rotate the factors in a particular kind of way because you're looking for something that you're, that you're having some, some guesses or some speculation about, and that leads you to some rotations rather than other rotations. Um, you know, a lot of people object to doing uh, judgmental rotation because they think you're playing fast and loose with the facts. You're just looking for your own preconceived notions. Well, in a way that's the case, but, but recall when uh, that uh, group of physicists went down to Africa to look uh, at, <clears throat> at uh, uh, 
uh, at this dark area during the, the solar eclipse because they were expecting, if Einstein was correct, to be able to see a star that according to classical theory, you couldn't see because it was behind the sun. But sure enough, they could see the star. Why? Because Einstein said that the that this, that light from the distant star is particles. That they're photons, they're particles, they have mass. Therefore, they are subject to um, uh, gravitational pull of the sun. And therefore, the light rays are going to bend around the sun because of the gravitational pull of the sun. And, and therefore, you're going to be able to see these things that are actually behind the sun. And that's what was earth shattering. But they were looking for something specific. Stevenson did the same thing with factor analysis. He was looking for something in particular uh, and therefore trying to find out whether the data that he had would support this notion or this guesswork or this intuition or speculation that he had. Uh, now that's abduction in a more active kind of sense. Uh, and he also left abduction open to instrumentation. That is, uh, even Rorschach techniques will give you uh, findings that you wouldn't get were it not for the instrumentation. Uh, certain things are going to show up in psychoanalytic free associations that aren't going to show up under normal circumstances because of the specific conditions of the psychoanalytic uh, session in which you're just freely associating and so forth, certain surprising kinds of things that are going to pop up and you're not going to see those were it not for the instrumentation that you were using. So Stevenson saw instrumentation as also contributing uh, to the abductory possibilities um, in the pursuit of an understanding of certain kinds of, of phenomena. Um, James Rhodes, myself, and, and uh, Amanda Wolf in uh, New Zealand have this uh, paper that says, uh, laid moribund for three or four years uh, because we submitted it it's about abduction and Q methodology, submitted it to the uh, Charles Peirce Society, which is mainly a bunch of philosophers interested in you start showing a bunch of philosophers, factor analysis and other kinds of things and their eyes kind of glaze over. <laughs> and so it uh, was not rejected, although they thought it was quite interesting, uh, but they didn't exactly know what to do with it. So uh, they uh, rejected it. So we've got to come back to that at, at some point. Um, but that is also a, an aspect of Stevenson's work that was very central to him. That is, it is, for all intents and purposes, absent, even amongst the practitioners of the Q Methodology Society of I4S, who, I mean, some, uh, uh, you know, sampling was done and shown that most people use principal components. And that I think was used as an argument by some people so, you know, that's the predominant, the preferred method in Q methodology. It's not, it's not the preferred method in Q methodology. You know, if, you're, if you mean by Q methodology what Stevenson meant by it, you should be doing judgmental theoretical rotation of trying to make discoveries, not in trying to, to, uh, to use um, methods like Verimax that, that give you some kind of single right answer for this set of data, because there are innumerable other possibilities. And why should you accept that one just because it has certain statistical characteristics about it compared to some other rotation that may not be in simple structure, may not be what Vermax is you, but may be more at the heart of the matter um, from an abductor standpoint. And that also takes us full circle because, <laughs> you know, the principal components Verimax that's looking for some statistical clean solution is really a th throwback to the discussion between R and Q about objectivity and subjectivity. Yeah, it is. It, it's, it, so that does take us back and we really ought to open this up to, to others and um, see if folks want to ask questions. Yeah. Um... So actually, quite a lot of the questions that we've had so far, and if people want to still add their questions, please feel free to keep adding them to the Q&A box. Um, and I think quite a lot of the questions are around that, that point. You know, people are saying, you know, I'm having a lot of, I'm spending a lot of time trying to convince either, you know, um, 
structural um, panels or reviewers about kind of issues around, you know, selecting your concourse or, you know, the fact that we do have small samples. And I think that that kind of goes to, to the points that you've raised quite a bit about actually this is a different method. It's, it's not trying to do the same thing, but I do, you know, and I think, I wondered if you, you guys actually had any good references that we could point people towards that might be able to kind of, I seem to remember a bit that Steve and maybe Yop were involved in about kind of like refuting some of the kind of critiques of, of Q methodology and whether that might be a good starting point to direct to people um, about, you know, why we use Q methodology in the way that we do and why it's great for the questions that we're trying to ask. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, as a political scientist, I'm certainly uh, aware of uh, the political context in which research takes place. This has always been the case. Uh, Galileo uh, was forced to recant some of his findings. Uh, and he is said to have remarked under his breath as he was signing this paper, rejecting all of his findings, you know, that the, that the earth moves and all of that kind of thing that went against religious doctrine uh, and said to himself, it moves anyway, <laughs> no matter what, I, what I'm signing my, my name to. Uh, Stevenson complained about that quite a lot during his life. And uh, there's an unpublished uh, uh, letter of his to the editors of the American psychologist roundly criticizing them from being, you know, uh, locked away in ancient kind of Newtonian way of thinking about things when science itself, they're trying to be scientists, but science itself has moved out from under them. Uh, science, it, that is physics and chemistry that existed in 1900 was quite different in, in uh, 2000 because of the, the effects of quantum theory and that led to a totally different understanding of physical reality uh, than Newton. And yet, um, uh, and yet uh, psychological science was still locked into this Newtonian kind of principle looking for, for universals, uh, assuming uh, Stevenson talked about the myth of unity um, uh, and locked into all these philosophical positions that were supported by the scientific community. Uh, and so I quite appreciate that. And so I, I, I tell graduate students, uh, go ahead and use principal components in Veramax, uh, you know, because you're, otherwise you're gonna get in trouble with your, with your committee members and with reviewers and so forth. That's a, not a bad place to begin your career. Uh, but as you move into it, become more sophisticated, uh, you're going to want to uh, become more of a scientist. Uh, and to, to uh, uh, accept what some of these uh, people who are ahead of themselves, like Charles Sanders Peirce, like J.R. Cantor, for instance, who Stevenson greatly admired, um, uh, who were sort of ahead of the curve as far as science was concerned. Uh, and also people like Paul Lange, some of these outstanding philosophers that people will, will acknowledge in the, in the breach uh, but will not really follow. Uh, just like you have a lot of people who will call themselves Q methodologists, will, will uh, use uh, Q sorts, factor analysis and all of that kind of thing, but will also use principal components and, and Veramax and so forth uh, that Stevenson expressly rejected for good reasons. Um, and so it's, it, it's sort of like, sort of like Marxism, a lot of people who claim to be Marxists, but never, never read Marx. Uh, people who claim to be Christians, who, and who may in fact have read the Bible, but have selectively read, have read the, 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 the print that's in, printed in red, the red letter editions of the Bible and so forth, and ignored other uh, aspects of the Bible. Uh, so those are real political constraints. Grant, people who give out grants, they're gonna demand that you do certain kinds of things. The whole setup, if you, uh, if you answer a call for papers by the National Science Foundation in the United States, for instance, it wants to know what are your hypotheses? How are you gonna test that? It's all hypothetical deductive. When you take your courses in beginning in graduate school, 
you learn the hypothetical deductive, the statistical method. You get a hypothesis, you get statistics that are going to enable you to test that hypothesis. Over, and that's what science is all about. In political science, my field, what is science all about? Survey research. The idea of, you know, I had all kinds of trouble with my committee because I had such a small number of people. Fortunately, I had William Stevenson on my committee to help fight back. Um, uh, I almost did not get my doctorate. He had to talk a couple of people into changing their votes while I was out of the room. Um, and so I, I appreciate that. And, and uh, unlike, I, I'm more like Galileo. I'll go ahead and sign the paper and tell my graduate student, okay, go ahead and use principal components. That's the quick and dirty way of getting the kind of results that nobody's going to question if you do that. Uh, you can go ahead and get it published quite easily. But uh, as you grow older, if you're wanting to take science as opposed to statistics, it's not, those are not the same, statistics and science. If you want to take the science part seriously, uh, you may want to do other kinds of things. You may have difficulty publishing them <laughs> because of the scientific establishment. But we have changed the scientific establishment. Uh, Editors of journals are wise, a lot of journals are wiser about Q methodology. They know that it's not just the transpose of an R data matrix. We've won some of those battles, but it's much slower than I would have thought when I started my career, you know, now more than 50 years ago. Uh, it's difficult to do. Uh, how do you go about getting reviewers and editors to accept that you did a judgmental rotation because it looks like you're just being subjective about, you know, a factor analysis. It's like saying, well, you know, I don't like the regression line being where it minimizes the sum of, of uh, square deviations from the regression line. So I'm going to put the regression line someplace else. Who would do that? Uh, what would be the justification for it? And similarly, why would you take something like simple structure and the Baramac solution and move it someplace. You've got to have good reason. So it would, it's going to take a lot. And Stevenson, Stephen with you, they just don't think like physicists. You know, that, uh, you know, it was his, his life as a physicist and understanding how scientists really think about things. They think differently than other people. Um, so, um, uh, I, I can sympathize and I don't have any easy way out. Uh, I know it's a struggle uh, and that we're not going to win a lot of the, of the wars and are going to be marginalized. Stevenson wrote uh, one of his posthumously published papers. It was actually two papers. It's called, um, what was it? Uh, um, it was about his view of, of, of psychometrics having been ignored, that he, he had written some basic papers in the journal Psychometrica back in the 1930s, but no one had followed what he had to say. Um, and uh, so he had been marginalized. And, and that's the way those who, what had happened to Copernicus, he was not allowed to publish his book in his lifetime. Uh, it happened to Kepler. Kepler was on the run from the, from the, um, the military. Actually the, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, what was it, the Catholic, uh, Inquisition? Inquisition, yeah. The Inquisitioners uh, had to be on the run and finally took refuge out on an island uh, where this, uh, this uh, person with a lot of prestige protected him. Um, uh, I think that I wanted to ask just another question that I think links into that one. So somebody's asked us about uh, you know, how might you approach the analysis of interview data alongside Q factor analysis? And I think that again leads into, you know, how do you use that as part of your judgmental rotation if that's a kind of process that you want to follow? I think we've uh, been somewhat successful on that uh, within the Q community because a lot of people used to not do interviewing. They would just take the Q sort to analyze them, interpret them and, you know, write a conclusion and so forth. Uh, but realizing that there's a kind of a cultural context within which this occurs, that these statements don't have an a priori meaning like they do in our methodology, this is a measure of depression. You agree with it, you're depressed because, you know, all kinds of tests of reliability and validity and so forth have already taken place before we use it 
And so it is what it is. It's a measure of something specifically. Uh, we realize that in Q, when, you're, when you take subjectivity seriously, that these are gonna mean what the Q sorter says they mean. That's the, what they're responding. That's why they're giving this a plus five instead of a plus one uh, or a minus two instead of a plus three. You know, that it's because of their understanding of what they mean and the significance of what their meaning of that is uh, on this uh, scale. And so we, uh, so interpretation is a necessary function of Q methodology and it comes after the people have responded. Now, why, why did you do that? Uh, so I, I think that the, uh, these uh, interviews afterwards are very useful if we can get them. Now, <laughs> when you have coronavirus, it's not always easy to get the interviews because you can't go outdoors and you can't meet with other people because they might have it or you might give it to them. Um, so that places constraints and that those are conditions under which uh, uh, Q sorting, you know, remotely uh, has a justification under the under the circumstances. But it's a good idea where it's possible to ask people after they've done the Q sort, why'd you do it that way, so that they can elaborate. Um, so I, those those yeah. are important. They're not absolutely important, but they are important. Yeah, and I also leading into a, a, a kind of similar question. Mm -hmm again, for anybody on the panel, really, do you have any advice about how to interpret factors? So you've done your key sort, you've probably done some interviews. How do you then start thinking about interpreting your factors? Mm -hmm. I'd be glad to defer to someone else, give others a chance. Why don't you go ahead, Dan, and then I'll chime in if I... Well, uh... this may be idiosyncratic, but I'm, I make a model of the... Um the uh, the factor scores and uh, hang it by uh, in some cases my desk uh, and uh, just say I'm gonna let it speak to me I mean that sounds mystical I'm I'm sure uh, but it's interesting. Uh, I might wake up and see uh, the arrangement of a, a given set of statements and then it'll all of a sudden make sense to me. Mm -hmm. Or it could be through an interview. Or, uh, But uh, like most things with Q, there's no, in my experience, hard and fast way of doing it. Uh, but uh, uh, that 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 way, hang, hanging uh, written on Manila folder the the dif distinguishing statements, where I uh, can look at it uh, randomly, so to speak, uh, it begins to say something uh, somewhat uh, irregularly, but uh, all, at the same time, it, it uh, it's kind of it works. I mean, like, like uh, for me, that that that's that's been a a, um, a way that I feel, uh, and uh, I I would say that uh, a good thing is doubting my ability to interpret the factors, um, because I mean, just as as an example, I have ne nephews and nieces who voted for Donald Trump, and texting with them is. Uh, not a joyous occasion, and uh, it is, I, I still can't pretend that I have any idea what motivates them and, and how they see the world so differently than I do. But, uh, and, and I'm the same way with Q factors. Uh, I, I, I will confess my ignorance of factor B if I'm on factor A. Uh, Although I do uh, in uh, all my Q studies, at least one Q sort by myself, uh, it, it, it does help in some regards. Uh, but uh, no, uh, otherwise I, I, I'm open to suggestions on how we might go about doing it. Uh, I do pretty much the same thing that you do, Dan, except I, I take the cards and order them by factors. So if I have three or four factors, I've got three or four different uh, cards and I'll, I'll read through factor A. 
three or four times. And then what I'll do is I'll lay factor A out on a table. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, I've got a seminar room that's near me that is perfect for this. And then just look at that, you know, pour over. And then I'll do the same for B and the same for C. And I do that in advance of looking at the statements that are most distinguishing according to the computer program. So that I'm coming into it with some kind of sense before I look at that and say, oh yeah, now, now that's beginning to make more sense to me. So it may be idiosyncratic to me, but I do something quite similar to you. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's anybody who shared an office with me when I was writing my PhD, they would have also experienced that because I used to just, yeah, lay all of the statements out. I had five factors. They were just on the floor around our office and I would just walk around them like every kind of couple of hours. <laughs> um, yeah. What does that say to me? What does that tell me? Um, annoying for the six of the people I shared my office with, I'm sure. <laughs> but it, it did help me just to kind of get that immersion in what was going on and, you know, before I then started to look at any other kind of information that I had. Um, and by I the way, I encourage students of mine to do that too. Yeah. Uh, because they, it, it sometimes becomes much more clear for them uh, when they're going about interpreting their factors by that physical representation. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I applaud all three of you because that's exactly right. But, uh, and I think the, the so-called crib sheet that uh, uh, um, Watson Stinner suggest uh, is an approximation to that. I wouldn't re restrict myself just to those that, that they highlight that it is these statements that are higher than they are in the other factors, distinguishing statements, but the entire factor array. Uh, it used to be that interpretation would only deal with the plus five and plus four statements, the minus five and minus four. Uh, but even statements, you know, at zero and plus one, plus two can, uh, can, particularly if they're distinguishing statements, uh, can oftentimes be uh, very uh, helpful in clarifying what a, what a particular point of view. But, but this has been problematic to others who are, who are not in the Q methodology business. Uh, Wilfred Beyond, the, the British psychoanalyst uh, in dealing with clients and patients uh, said you had to, to, uh, to relieve yourself of memory and desire. Uh, because memory draws you to the past. What did, what did the person say before? Desire projects you into the, to the future. Uh, and that takes you out of the immediate present. Um, Stevenson was also interested in the immediate experience of movies, uh, you know, in, in the immediacy of the situation. Uh, people who are involved in mindfulness, I know uh, Raffaella uh, Zanoli and, and uh, uh, Simona, are both interested in mindfulness. Uh, <laughs> going to mindfulness training is good training to be a Q methodologist. How can you be put yourself in the immediate present? How can you uh, divest yourself of memory and desire in, in order to see the phenomenon as it is, to try to understand something as it is? Um, and uh, so sometimes, you, and incidentally, what Dan said, previously, and, but I think it, I know Jim has done as well, the investigator doing his or her own Q sort and putting it in there so that you know where is the, where is the position of the observer in the observational field. Knowing that I'm on factor A uh, alerts me not to be too uh, kind <laughs> to factor A just because that's me in, in William James is me versus mine. Factor A is me, factor B is mine. Uh, it's not me. Um, and so I might have an investment in that factor. Knowing that I'm there alerts me to that and helps protect me against uh, falsely, you know, giving in to the temptation to be very generous with factor A and more harsh with factors B and C because they're not me. Um, so uh, it's, uh, this is where I think the rest of life can play a part. Uh, seeing a lot of movies, reading a lot of literature, <laughs> poetry uh, uh, enables you to become more aware of the diversity of viewpoints that exist in the world uh, and, and uh, helps 
condition you to, to be open to other people's ways of thinking that may not be ones that you have. Um, so it's very hard to give an answer to that. A great point. I think that, especially in a, a social media age, I know that, you know, I, I follow a, a number of things that are really similar to my own viewpoints. So of course, I just see, you know, the same things repeated back at me. And I think that doesn't help when I then come to analyze a cue sort when I think, well, why on earth would those people think like that? And, and I find it really difficult to do that interpretation. So I think, yeah, thinking, thinking wider, that mindfulness, just being in the moment, what's happening um, is a really important yeah. way to describe that. If the members of the audience haven't read Stevenson's paper on interpretation, it's worth, because there you run into the Sontag rule of feel more, hear more, what was the third one? Uh, see more, feel more, there, there's something else, think more, that, that sounds it, but something, before you jump to an interpretation. Um, and uh, that, it's very good advice. And it's a, it's a very good article that gives guidance to, uh, to others who might be in a position to have to interpret a Q factor, Q sort. We are at our time. We're at half past oh. four. <laughs> I know, time has flown. Um, would anybody like to make any final comments before I kind of wrap up the session and close this out? Um, the only thing I'd like to say is, first of all, I'd like to thank both Steve and Dan. And uh, I, I think this demonstrates that there are, we may need to do something like this again at some point because there are a number of central ideas that we didn't get a chance to address, but that's for a later date. Yeah. We also have the, uh, and my thanks also to the other uh, panelists and for your uh, insights. Uh, uh, we also have the Q method discussion list uh, where these things can continue. I see that somebody has asked, where is the reference to the, uh, to the Stevenson paper on the interpretation? And we'd be glad to post that if, uh, if somebody asked that question on the uh, list. Um, so the discussion can go in slow motion on the cumulative list. Uh, this has been a, a great kickoff. So thanks to everybody. Keep up the work. Okay, well, thank you very much, everybody, for uh, joining us today. Um, as I say, we have events throughout the rest of the week. Um, the registration for events that will take place tomorrow and Wednesday has already closed, but if you are now you know, burning questions that we've not addressed today that are on the topics that we're going to be covering um, tomorrow, which is that introduction to online cue sorting. And then Wednesday is a workshop run by um, Dr. James Bartlett on um, preparing for dissertation using cue methodology. Then please email me off list just to my personal email address. It'll be all over any emails that you've had about the, this um, virtual conference. Then just let me know and I can send you um, a link separately. I'm only sending out links one day in advance of the session. So if you are coming to a session, say on Thursday or Friday, and you've not received a link yet, don't worry, it will arrive. I'm just kind of um, staggering them so you, they don't all get lost in our inboxes. Um, but yeah, thank you again. Thanks to all of you for um, like taking part in this plenary and thanks to everybody for all of the questions that we've had. Thanks for organizing it, Helen, you did a great job. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you, Helen. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.